on World News Tonight. Striking conflict. Details revealed on the US drone strike as fears grow over terrorism in Afghanistan. Historic visit. U.S. House Speaker touchdown in Taiwan defying stern warnings from China. Military coup. A state of emergency in Myanmar has been extended for another six months. And ballooning away. New Jersey's Hot Air Balloon Festival is back for the kid in everyone. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, following the killing of the Al-Qaeda leader, a senior U.S. official lays out the details of the operation to locate and kill Ayman al-Zawahir. Senior officials say a drone fired two Hellfire missiles that hit the third floor balcony of Zawahir's apartment in an unscalable neighborhood of Kabul. The U.S. says that there were no other casualties reported. How does a government target an elusive militant leader? In the case of al-Qaeda chief Ayman al-Zawahiri, killed by the U.S. government over the weekend, it's through careful, patient and persistent work by counterterrorism and intelligence agencies, according to a senior administration official. Zawahiri's death, the biggest blow to al-Qaeda since the U.S. killed its founder Osama bin Laden in 2011, came after he had been in hiding for years, rumored to have been in Pakistan's tribal area or inside Afghanistan. Speaking on condition of anonymity, the official laid out the details, starting with how the U.S. government had been aware of a network that supported Zwahiri. Over the past year, following the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan, officials had been watching for indications of al-Qaeda's presence in the country. This year, they confirmed that Swahiri's family, his wife, his daughter, and her children, had relocated to a safe house in Kabul. Zwahiri was later identified at the same location. Once at the safe house, Zwahiri stayed put and was identified multiple times on the balcony of the house. By April, President Joe Biden was briefed by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. On July 1st, after weeks of meetings, the president and his top advisors, including CIA Director William Burns, convened in the White House Situation Room, where Biden was presented with a plan to take out Zwahiri. Senior interagency lawyers confirmed that Zwahiri was a lawful target based on his continuing leadership of al-Qaeda. On July 25th, Biden was given a final briefing. The president then authorized a precise, tailored airstrike on the condition that it minimized the risk of civilian casualties. The strike was carried out at 9.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1.48 GMT, on July 30th by a drone firing so-called Hellfire missiles, striking Zwahiri where he had often been spotted, on the balcony of his safe house. A high-profile diplomatic trip to Taiwan by a U.S. congressional delegation led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is garnering much global attention as it comes despite earlier warnings by China against playing with fire. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has praised Taiwan as one of the free society in the world. Speaking before a closed-door meeting between a U.S. congressional delegation and members of the Taiwanese parliament, she said she hopes to increase talks between the governments of the two countries. We want to increase interparliamentary cooperation and dialogue. And we do so at a time when our president has put forth an Asian Pacific initiative which we support and we want to be specific in terms of how we work with Taiwan in that regard. After addressing Parliament, she headed to the presidential office for a meeting with the Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. In response to Pelosi's visit, China launched a series of joint military operations in waters around Taiwan starting Tuesday night. Chinese state media posted a map on Twitter showing six areas around Taiwan where it said the military would hold drills from Thursday through Sunday. However, the Biden administration was keen to contain tensions with China over Pelosi's visit. The White House National Security Council spokesperson noted that it was Pelosi's right to visit Taiwan, but also stressed that the trip did not violate Chinese sovereignty or America's long-standing one-China policy. 
Now, there's no reason, as I said yesterday, for Beijing to turn this visit, uh, uh, which is consistent with longstanding U.S. policy, into some sort of crisis, or use it as a pretext to increase aggressiveness uh, and, and military activity in or around the Taiwan Strait now or beyond her travel. Pelosi arrived in Taiwan late on Tuesday, making her the highest-ranking U.S. official in a quarter of a century to visit the self-ruled island, which is claimed by China. Still in the U.S., floods unleashed by torrential rains in eastern Kentucky have killed at least 37 people, including four children. Governor Andy Bashir said that while warning that more dangerous weather is approaching the region. Nearly a week after flash floods turned eastern Kentucky into a disaster zone, rescue teams continue search and recovery in remote, challenging terrain. More than 1,300 rescued, but tonight we think hundreds of people are missing. Not even Kentucky's governor knows for sure. And we are going to be not only searching for people, probably for weeks to come, but we're going to be rebuilding for at least a year to come. There's no escaping the reality of what searches could bring. At least 37 people confirmed dead, including 78-year-old Rita Hall, 82-year-old Nellie Mae Howard, and 65-year-old Diana Ambergie. Searching the disaster zone, FEMA teams are prepared for that number to rise. Door by door, they check on residents. The worst destruction gets a closer look as some Kentuckians are still unaccounted for, like Dennis Stacy, whose home was swallowed by floodwaters. He hasn't been heard from since, according to his daughter, who says her sister gave a DNA sample. Survivors facing unimaginable loss, struggling with a way forward. People left with absolutely nothing. Uh, homes that we don't know where they are, just entirely gone. Monkeypox infections have nearly quintupled in two weeks and they continue to increase across the United States. With that, President Joe Biden named a team of disaster management and health officials to lead the U.S. response to the monkeypox outbreak as infections continue to rise. President Joe Biden has appointed two top federal officials to coordinate his administration's response to monkeypox. That's according to the White House on Tuesday. The announcement comes as more states declare emergencies in an effort to boost their vaccine supplies and other resources to combat the virus. Although the Biden administration has stopped short of declaring a national emergency, top officials from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will coordinate the U.S. response across the federal government. Robert Fenton, a FEMA regional administrator, will serve as the White House monkeypox coordinator and Dimitri Daskalakis, the CDC's HIV prevention chief, will serve as deputy coordinator. The appointments come as the U.S. aims to bolster vaccine efforts to slow the spread of a monkeypox outbreak that has infected more than 5,800 Americans. Unlike when COVID-19 emerged, there are already vaccines and treatments available for monkeypox, which was first documented in Africa in the 1970s. Companies, however, must scale up production to meet rising demand. California and Illinois on Monday each announced a state of emergency over monkeypox, following New York's declaration last week. Monkeypox, which spreads through close physical contact, causes flu-like symptoms and pus-filled skin lesions, though it is rarely fatal. It also spreads less easily than the novel coronavirus. On July 23rd, the World Health Organization declared monkeypox a global health emergency. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News tonight. Now, Myanmar's military government extended the state of emergency that upholds its power for six more months. Its leader promised to follow through on some of the points agreed with the leaders of ASEAN more than a year ago, none of which have been fulfilled so far. The state of emergency in Myanmar has been extended by six months. A state-run newspaper on Monday quoted the country's military chief, Senior General Minong Hlaing, saying this was to strengthen what he called the genuine and disciplined multi-party democratic system, which he says was the desire of the people. The ruling state administration council had first declared a state of emergency when Senior General Minong Hlaing seized power via a coup in February 2021. They toppled the democratically elected Aung San Suu Kyi government and has since killed more than 2,000 civilians, according to a Thailand-based human rights organization. 
Witnessing the violence in the country, the international community, mainly ASEAN countries, have called on Myanmar to immediately put an end to the violence. Last April, nine ASEAN leaders met with Minang Hlai and composed a five-point consensus. They ranged from ending violence in the country to maintaining dialogue via special envoy visits to Myanmar. However, a year has passed and Minang Hlai has been accused of defying each point. That's why in a televised speech broadcast on Monday, the junta chief said he would meet some of the points in the consensus within this year. He explained that the military was only unable to implement the five-point consensus because there wasn't enough stability as a result of internal riots and because of the ongoing pandemic. Exact details on which parts of the consensus he will address first have not yet been revealed. Yemen's warring sides agreed to renew a two-month truce expiring, the United Nations envoy said, despite international pressure from an extended and expanded deal that would build on the longest stretch of relative calm in over seven years. It's been the longest period of respite for Yemen after seven years of war. The country's warring parties will renew its existing two-month truce that was set to expire on Tuesday, announced UN envoy Hans Grundberg. This truce extension includes a commitment from the parties to intensify negotiations to reach an expanded truce agreement as soon as possible. The extension falls short of a proposed six-month renewal of the ceasefire. Both Yemen's internationally recognized government and the country's Houthi rebels disagreeing on certain demands, mistrust running deep. Yemeni say they want the truce to lead to lasting peace. I hope that the truce will be an opening to direct negotiations for lasting peace that restores stability. People are suffering greatly. A truce like the previous one is useless because it's neither war nor peace. Yemen needs a truce. The already four-month-old truce came into effect in April this year after the capital Sana'a was seized by the Iran-aligned Houthi rebels in 2014, forcing the government to flee. In 2015, a Saudi-led coalition intervened to try and restore the government to power. Washington welcomed the extended ceasefire, which they say has brought Yemen unprecedented calm. We're grateful for the leadership of Saudi Arabia throughout this truce process, as well as the Sultan, as well as for the Sultan and leaders uh, of Oman, who have also played an important role throughout. These five months, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're talking about seven years of war and thousands and thousands of Yemeni lives, it counts for a lot. More than 150,000 people have been killed during almost eight years of fighting in what the UN says is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. More than 7 million people are in need or in urgent humanitarian assistance in Somalia. The Food and Agricultural Organization said as the UN agency warned that parts of the country could experience famine next month. Fatima Adan Kuso walked more than 180 miles with her two children to Somalia's Dolo, surviving on handouts along the way. Her country is in the grip of a hunger crisis, with the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization warning that parts of Somalia could experience famine in September. The FAO said eight regions in the Horn of Africa country could be affected by famine. If livestock continue to die, key commodity prices rise further, and humanitarian assistance fails to reach the most vulnerable. That's after unprecedented poor rainfalls and intense dry conditions. More than three million animals, essential to Somalia's pastoral and agro-pastoral communities, have died so far. Crop production has substantially dropped. And that's why families like Fatima's and that of farmer Hassan Abdul Quran are being forced to flee their homes. Since the beginning of this year, drought has displaced more than 900,000 people. The FAO says it reached a little over 265,000 households between January and June this year. But that the scale of assistance currently being delivered and the amount of funding from the international community is not sufficient. Those requiring urgent humanitarian assistance has increased from 4.1 million at the start of the year to 7.1 million between June and September. Now the EU Tourism Board is experiencing a downfall in their tourism industry as new reports by the World Travel and Tourism Council shows over 1 million tourism sector jobs remain unfilled in the EU. 
In 2022, Italy will be the country most affected by a shortage of staff in the tourism sector. According to a study by the World Travel and Tourism Council, 250,000 workers will be missing this year, meaning one in six vacancies will not be filled. In total, there will be 1.2 million job vacancies in the European Union. 71,000 will remain unfilled in France. Among the hardest hit sectors is aviation, with nearly one in three vacancies. In the United Kingdom, 128,000 positions are unfilled. Restaurants and hotels are struggling to find staff, but the British government has so far opposed bringing in temporary workers from abroad. Portugal, meanwhile, is the least affected by staff shortages, with 49,000 vacancies. The study also provides some tips to attract more workers, which include facilitating worker mobility with a more favourable visa policy, allowing flexible and remote work, adopting innovative technology and digital solutions, and offering training, refresher programmes and benefits to employees. South Korea's first lunar probe, Danuri, blasts off from a space station in Florida. The rescheduled launch coming after it was delayed for two days. Arriving at Florida's Orlando Airport last month, South Korea's first lunar probe, Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, also known as Tanuri, was transported from Incheon in a special vibration-free container. After arriving at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, the lunar probe underwent a month of checks. And so far, no problems have been reported on Tanuri. The probe will be sent into space on the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Originally, Tanuri was supposed to be launched Tuesday local time, but SpaceX said a week ago that the launch had to be delayed because it needed additional work during the rocket inspection process. On Tuesday, Tanuri was connected to the top of Falcon 9, or the fairing module, and will soon be connected to the rest of the rocket before the launch. When Tanuri and Falcon 9 are fully connected, they will be moved to the launch pad and stand upright the day before the launch. Once further inspections take place and it's fully fueled, the countdown begins. Assuming nothing goes wrong with the launch, the lunar probe should reach the moon by December. Tanuri will be launched at Thursday, 7.08 p.m. local time, which is Friday, 8.08 a.m. at Korea Standard Time. After about 40 minutes after the launch, Tanuri will separate from the Falcon 9 rocket and will be able to show video footage using its own camera. And about an hour after the launch, the ground station will be able to receive its first communication signals. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A child has become the latest victim of Ghana's first ever outbreak of the deadly Marburg virus, which brings the total number of fatalities to three. Kansas voters rejected an effort to remove abortion protections from the state's constitution, a resounding win for the abortion rights movement in the first statewide electoral test since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. South Korea has seen its total of COVID-19 infections surpass the 20 million mark, meaning two of the five people have been infected. Farmers in Tuscany, the heart of Italy's wine and olive oil industry, the battling to salvage as much as they can of this year's crop from the ravaging drought and heat wave. Revenue from Uber's rideshare business surged to 120% to $3.55 billion, while that of the delivery segment rose to 37% to $2.69 billion in the quarter ended June 30th. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, let's take a look at the 39th New Jersey Lottery Festival of Ballooning. Stay safe and have a good night.